in a world where most people watch movies and then forget about them. These brave heroes join forces to watch them again and then talk about them. Join them in their epic journey as they go back in time, a decade and beyond, to revisit and break down films from a vast array of genres. Do these movies hold up over time? Are they classics? Find out on Retro Movie Roundtable. Starring your hosts, Brian Fry, Chad Robinson, Dustin Melbarnes, Lizzie Haynes, and Russell Guest. Coming now to Headphones in Your Ears. Welcome, all you lords, ladies, and knights of the Retro Movie Roundtable, where we watch movies and then talk about them. I'm your host, Dustin Melbardis, and joining me today is my good friend and co-host, Chad Robinson. Chad, how are you? I mean, it's mockumentary time. I'm excited. It's mockumentary madness. How did your bracket end up? Oh, man, that's a tough one. I I have still got to take my dealer's choice with Behind the Mask, Rise of Leslie Vernon. That is my favorite mockumentary the favorite you know what you introduced that to me i was so lucky that you introduced that to me i've seen a bunch of them uh and i don't re-watch them very often but uh for tonight's movie i think i might be changing that particular oh yeah uh, pattern for me i went on a streak yeah and before we get into tonight's movie, I want to introduce our guest. I guess I should say reintroduce our guest. You'll remember him from the Silverado episode, returning for his second time, coming to you from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. It's our special guest, Matt Glidden. Matt, how are you? Hello, everybody out there. I'm doing very well. Glad to hear, because tonight we are going to be covering one of those mockumentaries. We'll talk about it in a moment. But this this particular mockumentary, is really a who's who of working comedians from the 80s, the 90s, four decades ago, a lot of experience. And some of them have gained fame, but others have never really hit superstardom. Uh, Matt, I want to ask this to you. Who's that background comedian that shows up in a movie and really brightens it up for you? I think he classifies as a comedian. He may or may not hit the classification of background, but I'm going to go with whenever Steve Buscemi pops up in the background, he brightens it it up. Yeah, it it counts if he if he's got a small bit part. Gosh, what does that make me think of? Mr. Deeds, he's got such a small part in. Do you remember this one? Adam Sandler yeah. loves to use him. Yeah, yeah, yeah he, he's and just small, crazy eyes. Billy Madison is fantastic with his kill list. That's right. That's right. How do I forget that one? I went to Mr. Deeds before Billy Madison. What's wrong with me? I I have no idea what you're doing there. <laughs> Uh, what about you, Chad? Who's your favorite like background comedian that can really spice something up for you? Does Jay Chandrasekhar count? I mean, he's really upfront with the broken lizard stuff, but he right. pops up in Community, Psych, Brooklyn Nine Nine, things that I love. And he's for those that don't know, he's thorny in Brand Super Troopers. Yes. Yeah. Yes, so he is fantastic in everything he shows up in these side projects on. So he makes me laugh. I guess I, I don't think of him as uh, – everything I've seen Jay Chandrasekhar in, he has been in that starring role. Uh, but I, I do enjoy him. I would say the same thing about all those guys probably. Kevin Heffernan next. Yes. I think those are the two that I would more that I would most recognize. Farva. <laughs> Lieutenant Farva. For me, and I'm I may be cheating a little bit by pulling from today's movie, uh, David Cross yes. he has a wonderful comedy career. Many will know him, I think, from Arrested Development, from playing a, a big character, Dr. Tobias Funke, in that show. But even still, I would say most of his work is not superstardom. Like, he's not a leading man. Yeah. Yeah, that's fair. I love when he pops up. Yeah. And same same go. It's hard to pick, though, because uh, Fred Willard was a close second. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Matt, what's what's the last movie you saw? I believe it would have been the greatest beer run ever. It's an Apple uh, produced movie about guys during Vietnam goes and delivers some beer to his buddies in Vietnam. It was a great movie ever. Yeah. True story. Funny and uh, meaningful commentary on Vietnam. Wow. Yeah. Didn't expect that. I, when you said the greatest beer run ever, I was expecting um, broken was expecting lizard kind of, <laughs> kind of like that. Or something along like the hot tub time machine era yes. of movie. That's what I was, was expecting. 
Chad, what's the last movie you saw? I watched the 2017 Korean horror film Mimic, and it's about finding a lost child in the woods and why you never take them home with you. Uh, it, it should have been better than what it was. It had a lot of themes of fear of losing your own child. The The lead actress had lost her child, and so this was almost like a replacement or she had a heart for it. Had all the themes to make it better, and it just it wasn't. Folks, you know where to come for your Korean horror that is to, to Chad and the Retro Movie Roundtable. Oh, I, I've got a top 50. <laughs> of Korean horror. <laughs> <laughs> Mimic? That was, is that what you said it was called? Mimic, yes. It was remade in 2020 for the American version for people that don't like subtitles and also like lesser movies. <laughs> for people who like the worst versions. Uh, yes, yeah. Russell. <laughs> Russell. Uh, <laughs> well, uh, Chad, I, I, I watched a horror movie. Excellent. I, want, I actually kind of want to give you some clues to see if you can suss it out. Um, 1985, it is a movie about a product that is alive, that is bad for us as humanity. Can you? Is that enough for you to... Is that enough for you to blob, figure out? The Blob? Ooh, very similar to The Blob, actually. And it is it has a short t- title like that. Enough I'm, is never enough. I don't know. Of The Stuff. Have you seen I, The Stuff? I have not seen The Stuff. You have found what something. What has no. happened? I knew The Blob wasn't the right year. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. So, yeah. The, uh, enough is never enough of The Stuff. Uh, which is uh, kind of a cool, like culty kind of movie uh, with with a big following of people that have seen it. I think it's campy. Uh, it is kind of just like a, an older, enjoyable uh, romp. I think some of the performances are awful. That's okay. Uh, oh, you have no idea. My previous movie was Kill Her Goats, and the killer was named Goatface. Horrible. Goatface the killer, yeah. Or he, yeah, yeah, he had a goat mask and a chainsaw. One letter off from Ghostface. Yes. Well, we're not covering a horror. We are covering a mockumentary. Chad, what are we covering tonight? We are covering 1996's Waiting for Guffman. That's right. Starring Louis Arquette, Bob Balaban, Christopher Guest, Matt Kiesler, Eugene Levy, Catherine O'Hara, Parker Posey, and Fred Willard. Released in 96 at a film festival. It actually only released in like 50 theaters uh, in the States and only had one other country it was released in in total. A uh, $4 million budget only grossed uh, a little over $2 million, so didn't do much at the box office. Uh, placed 162 in the box office that year. Ahead of it, of course, we all remember Love, Valor, Compassion. Nope. Crickets. Mm. Nope. And then right behind it was, uh, at 163, In the Company of Men. I suppose we were all probably talking about Titanic that year, number one movie. Um, on IMDb, we've got a 7.4 rating. Rotten Tomatoes, the critics give this 91%, and the audience score mim- mimics that. Huh, mimics, no pun Ugh. intended, uh, at 91%. So people do hold this in high esteem, even though they didn't shell out the big bucks for it at the time. Won a couple of awards. Uh, San Francisco Chronicle said it was one of the best films of the year. In Texas here, the Lone Star Film and Television Awards gave it Best Film and Best Director. And it was nominated for some Independent Spirit Awards. Uh, Best Feature, Karen Murphy. Best Male Lead for Chris Guest. And Best Screenplay, which is Chris Guest and Eugene Levy. And it is important that we give some deference to our buddy Russell. It says that, uh, hey, on the 100 laughs list, it didn't make it. But it was nominated. And we know that Russell loves the AFI. This is the same thing with Funny Thing Happened on the Way to the Forum. It's like, it's in the top 500 and it was thought about for the 100, but it wasn't. (laughs) Right. So we're, we're going to waste your time. It yeah. is Meryl Streep's favorite movie. This seems a very strange thing. But wow. Yeah. Wow. I just watched a clip of Meryl Streep uh, two days ago. Um, <laughs> that's Yeah, that's this is her favorite movie. I could see that. I could see that this style of movie could be someone's favorite style. And I could see this. This is a warm place in many people's hearts. And I think, Matt, this might be a movie that is has, kind of holds a warm place in your heart. Uh, had you seen this before? Yeah, it has a warm place. I was introduced to it in college, watched it many times. It gets better with age. 
gets better with age. When it was introduced to you, I want to ask this question. How was it introduced? Because I, I, I did wonder, what do you say to someone to watch something like this mockumentary style? <laughs> yeah, and you have to go back in time, right? This is before the days of The Office and like any mockumentaries that are probably – you're familiar with like it was right. a little bit cutting edge uh, spinal tap was before it but yeah the pitch is it's weird it's quirky you're gonna love it and it's just he's so quirky and weird christopher guest specifically yeah and it, so it seems like your friend or your roommate or whoever it was in college kind of had to know you and had to know your tastes to sure. i would say it might be risky to introduce this to someone you don't know well uh, I had this exact conversation with Matt. Yes. I yeah. Well, life is full of risks, and this one <laughs> worth taking. Yeah. What, what were you going to say, Chad? That you were talking about how you how we, you present this. Yeah, Matt and I had this exact same conversation because I refused to give him any further information when he asked if I liked it. I just said, "This is not a movie." that you just casually suggest to someone, you have to know something about the person before you're like, Hey, go watch waiting for Guffman. Right. You, you have to know that they have the capacity for the subtle absurdity for the dryness, for the style of joke making for the ensemble cast, no big stars. You have to know that that's something that they would be into. Chad, what was your first time seeing this movie about? This was my first time. So I actually, there were a ton of mockumentary holes. So I watched this, then I watched this as Spinal Tap, saw Best in Show. I didn't get to A Mighty Wind, but I had a good time. I like mockumentaries. I will say this one, so there's like a sliding scale, right? And Napoleon Dynamite, is the that's where it falls off a cliff for me i do not like napoleon dynamite's class of humor i think it's just too awkward too cringeworthy i think this one comes dangerously close Mm -hmm. it teeters over the cliff at times but it fell on the right side for me i i had a good time right i think sometimes the question can be can are you comfortable being uncomfortable and i don't think this movie crossed the line but it was close. Uh, now I can handle the, I, th- I think for the longest time, the meet the parents movie and franchise was kind of the bell cow for the uncomfortable movie. Seeing how Ben Stiller's character deals with that family situation. Yeah. But uh, no, this is, this is similar. I'll say this was actually my first time watching it as well. Uh, I had heard of it, but given the title had no idea what it could be about. And that's nice sometimes when you don't really know what's going to be happening. Chad, what was your expectation for this movie? Oh my goodness. I have no idea. I don't (laughs) think, I don't think I was expecting cringe. I I guess I should have with Eugene Levy. He's got the American pie series to his name. I think that's where most people are going to associate him with. And he definitely has that cringe comedy, but then I see, uh, Catherine O'Hara, and it's okay. We've covered Home Alone. She's she's just she's kind of a chameleon. It's interesting to see her nice as well. Yeah, yeah. She's. It was nice to see her kind of stand on her own laurels and be funny here. And she's even funnier in Best in Show. So I like that they keep this band together. Well, Matt, you had seen it several times, and so this may have been the first time you were approaching it with almost a homework-style viewing, like maybe trying to be critical of some things or just basking in the things you already knew. Uh, What were your expectations coming into it this time? I expected to enjoy it again. Uh, My college friend (laughs) that I watched it with the first time actually texted me a few months ago, and we don't talk, and it hadn't been years, and all he texted me was, rewatched Waiting for Guffman, it's just as good as ever. <laughs> That's great. That's and, awesome. Uh, and I found it to be true. It was like coming home. Oh, nice. Now, I will say with any of the mockumentaries I've seen, I don't think I rewatch them that much. I think it's something where like kind of once you get the point of it, it's almost like a comedy test. 
like, do you understand the point or the direction of this comedy? And I think like, oh, you get it. Or you might decide like, oh, I don't get it. Matt, do you think that this movie holds up here, 2023? I do. I think it's the magic of it is all the one liners. Um, You know, it's going to be hard later on if we have to share our favorite line or quote. Uh, I think that's why I just wait throughout the movie for that line to be said. Okay, it's done. Now I'm waiting for that next line. Yes, there it was. And and sometimes it's not the line or the line delivery. It's sort of the situation in which the line comes up. Because we have some that uh, ideas in the movie, comedy ideas that are that are more like puns. We have some wordplay. And then we just have some like, I kind of can't believe this is happening. And we'll get to the point where we'll maybe discuss a bit of the improv that goes on here. Because improv, I think it's another risk. Like sort of like you said, some risks are worth taking, and it's a risk whether you like improv or not. Uh, Chad, are you generally an improv guy? I love it. I it just comes off as so organic, and I know that's kind of the nature of improv. But I I like them playing off of each other. I have talented, talented people, and I I'm a huge fan of whose line is it anyways, and just the style of okay, you you never say no. Whatever comes out of their mouth, that's what you're rolling with. And there's times in this movie where you definitely see that someone is pushing an idea on the improv stage or someone has just floated, oh, we're going to take this idea down the river and jump on the raft with me. And uh, I almost kind of look at it as a challenge as like these, these people have such great comedic chops that like, can we stick with this penis reduction joke? (laughs) <laughs> the stool song yes right and how does it fit in with in the middle of a chinese restaurant and it, like there's there's a there's a bunch of stuff that's like part of getting improv right seems to be can you make everything about the scene work and i think it's something where only the highest level improv is tolerable to a large audience uh, matt do you have an, a, an improv background or at least an appreciation for it I have some appreciation for it. I'm not a big whose line is it anyway junkie. I feel like a lot of them fall flat. But I think you got to keep in mind for this too. Uh, Christopher Guest had, I think it was nearly 60 hours worth of film. Yeah. He edited it down to us. And thankfully, the movie is actually only, it's a relatively short movie. So he took, we got the, the creme de la creme of the improv. Yes, this is Dustin and I's happy place. Yes, we like a nice tight 80, movie. <laughs> 80 to 90 minutes. We just we just covered a, a different movie, just recorded it two days ago, where they wanted a three-hour cut and everyone's screaming, no! Right. Yeah, I think this one comes in at 84 minutes, but really it's only, it's it, it's kind of more like 76 if you, if you take out the titles. So, or, so enough is just enough, and we, we get our amount Uh, Like the right amount of improv. I think for me, I like improv at its highest level. I like listening to comedy shows that are specifically about improv. Maybe one of the more popular ones. We have Improv for Humans. We also have Comedy Bang Bang out there on the West Coast. Uh, Some of those are great to listen to and some of them just aren't. And so I think what Chris Guest did here was like keep the best stuff. I think that's good work. Um, And, uh, you know, it shows his talents. Uh, But we're going to talk more about this movie after an advertisement break. A little message from some of our friends. When we come back, Chad is going to spoil the plot of this movie. He's going to tell you what happens. So it's probably a good idea for you, the listener, to go watch this movie. When we come back, we're going to talk about the plot. See you on the other side. Welcome to the All 80s Movies Podcast. I'm Bill. And I'm Jason, and this is the podcast where we talk about the blockbusters, the flops, and everything in between from one of the freshest decades for movies, the 1980s. So whether you're a brain, a jock, a valley girl, or a Jedi, we've got some 80s classics for you. Do these movies stand the test of time? Are we discovering something new? Is there an 80s movie we're finally watching for the first time? Join us each week as we dive into the cinematic nostalgia that inspired and influenced a generation. From the hits to the cult classics, we will discuss our earliest memories, favorite scenes, fun facts, and our not-so-favorite movie moments, too. It's the All 80s Movies Podcast, now available on all major streaming platforms. Please subscribe and happy listening. And we are back. 
it is time for Chad to give us a plot summary of Waiting for Guffman. Take it away. Blaine, Missouri is coming up on its 150th anniversary celebration, and the town's community theater decides to prepare a show called Red, White, and Blaine. The ragtag troupe is led by the eccentric director Corky St. Clair and includes travel agents Ron and Sheila Albertson, a perky DQ employee named Libby Mae Brown, Clifford Woolley, who has just lived there for a long time, Johnny Savage, great name, the mechanic, and the town dentist, Dr. Alan Pearl. Corky sends invitations to various Broadway producers, and to his surprise, Mort Guffman responds and says he'll attend the performance. Corky believes this is Blaine's shot to get their show on Broadway. Johnny is forced to quit the show by his father, and Corky has to take over the part at the last minute. Mort Guffman's seat is empty as our show starts, but an out-of-town gentleman soon fills the seat, and the players are ecstatic. We learn that the man is actually Roy Loomis, and that Mort was snowed in, but only after the play had concluded. The cast moves on with their lives. Libby moves to Alabama to work at a different DQ. Alan Pearl and our travel agents both pursue their dreams of being entertainers, and Corky moves back to New York, where he opens a Hollywood-themed novelty shop. Did I mention the play was hilariously bad? Hilariously bad? Oh, I don't know. I think Red, White, and Blaine, for the scope of this theater, was a huge success. You know what? I I agree. That's <laughs> like like so. The alien costume was terrible. I, I, it's terrible and it's awesome at the same time. But some of the songs, like, this is this is actually too good. Why is this so good? Well, let's turn it over to Matt because this is his place. This is one of his happier places. Uh, while I didn't think the alien part was the highlight of the show, maybe <laughs> we look at Red, White, and Blaine first because uh, we are kind of headed this direction. Uh, as kind of a centerpiece or like what we're going to tell us about red, white, and Blaine. Do you sing the songs to yourself? I can't say that the songs are my favorite part of the film. Um, but I do think the, the stool manufacturing song is, is my favorite <laughs> center working, of a stool boom and working. And then yeah, you know, it's the very, choreography was great. Yes. Oh, on the, on the topic of the choreography, they uh, they say the cast intentionally did not practice the choreography as much as they should have, so that as we watch it, it would look like they don't quite know the choreography yet, which is just wonderful. In this movie, which takes place in Blaine, Missouri, I think what we see, and I felt this when we saw it, I feel like we're not seeing... Eugene Levy and Catherine O'Hara and Fred Willard. I feel like we're not seeing actors play naive small town bumpkins. By the time the show gets put on, you kind of feel like, oh no, these small time, we'll say relatively low talent individuals actually pull off a coup and and put together something pretty special that we know the town loves. Like I think it was a, a, a rousing success. I mean, that trumpet player is my MVP because he's doing double duty. He's on the xylophone. He's on the timpani. Like A that, true triple threat. That is the star. I love the, the conductor of the music, his intensity. That's, <laughs> That's right. Lloyd, played by Bob Balaban. He's who, fantastic. <laughs> yeah, who, who is fantastic. Kind of a muted role. Uh, and that's kind of by design, is that he's not really in charge the things he wants to get done. He just wants to put on a show. And that leads me to sort of my first question here. I was looking for success in this movie. I think we, we're we set up with this format to see um, by design some type of failures or some types of conflict or some types of things going wrong, of which they do. However, we're also rooting for successes. What are the successes, whether it's character-driven, is it is Corky trying to make it back to New York, what are the successes you're rooting for in this movie, Matt? I think they're all just, they've captured middle America, these kind, good people, right? Like uh, you want them to succeed. You know, they're not Broadway stars, <laughs> right. um, but you can just tell they're genuine. They're just genuine desire is just captured so well. And I agree. 
you don't know that these are like superstar actors there. Like you think they're just these ordinary um, middle America, small town play people. Right. And now I think you can split up the success. I didn't ever think this was going to end with, and now we see Corky headlining a show. Yeah. Or, and now we see Libby May, uh, who is now working at a different Dairy Queen. And hey, thankfully her dad's out of prison. Um, she's working another Dairy Queen. And I guess that's, it's not really success here. I wasn't looking for anybody, any of them to like hit superstardom. I was just kind of hoping the show would go off without a hitch. And I was kind of surprised that when we get to the show, 55 minutes in, an hour in, that everything kind of goes smoothly. That was kind of a surprise to me. Interesting. Interesting. I've seen it so many times, I lost track of that kind of idea. Yeah. Yeah, when they mention like the entire town budget is 15000 <laughs> That's right. You run everything, and he's asking for what? He was asking for $100,000. Yeah. yeah, this stuck out to me because I made the mistake – so we, uh, myself, Brian, Russell, we all went to school together and Brian and myself and a couple other classmates, we did a video for our English class. We made our own movie and it was sort of in this style and we thought we were very clever with a lot of references and I rewatched that within the last couple of years and it's the most cringeworthy thing <laughs> I think I've seen and so a lot of this theater and dancing in these jokes. It's like, okay, I, I get this. I was in a, a small town theater group when, where I grew up in Charleston. And it'd be interesting sitting in the audience and watching this on the other side. I mean, Charleston, West Virginia is not a huge, huge area. I did church plays and it'd be the congregation was always very sweet. And they'd say, oh, that was so funny. And they'd come up to me afterwards. But I knew I was standing up and singing Who Let the Dogs Out, which had to be Oh, oh my. <laughs> I, I was supposed to be like the the terrible candidate to pick. And so at one point I lead all the other candidates in singing Who Let the Dogs Out. I have to imagine that's that's like watching Red, White, and Blaine. Okay, yeah. So so there are, it's almost as if like I can't pull my eyes away. <laughs> right. Right. It's I got to be on the other side of the audience. So I I empathize with some of the stupid things they have to do. Do you have any theater experience, Matt? I'm glad you asked. I was the only time I've ever been in a play was in college and I got the lead in 12 Angry Men. That is Whoa. awesome. That is a great movie. Yes, and even better play. Yes. Yes. All right. So you convinced everyone to take up your side. Did you put a knife in the middle of the table? I did. Yes. I did. And it was a uh, relatively small college. And that's what they capture. They capture like Chad was describing and like my experience. Like I put everything of myself into it. And the crowd, my parents, I think they were genuine in their appreciation of it. But there's no way it was good. Like it wasn't. Yeah. And that's right. how I think the majority of plays in America are. And they captured it. This authenticity, well, this genuineness. Yes. I, yes. I want this so bad. I are there videos? Maybe somewhere. I don't know. I don't have them. Oh, I need this. I need this in my life. There are no videos of me singing Who Let the Dogs Out. Not yet at least. We may have to <laughs> Retro movie revisit that one. Is, no. <laughs> well, you know, I, I think with this production, we're focused on the actors only. Because, I mean, I, I count Corky here. Um, we're really focused on that part. None of the art design or the musicians, we don't really have any interaction with them before the play goes on. It all just kind of works. Uh, but I, I think throughout the first 45 minutes when they're trying to get together, all of them have these dreams, these delusions in their head as to like what should happen. Uh, Dr. Pearl, played by Eugene Levy, really, really thinks of himself as as this comedic mind. And I think it's in this movie where he says, I wasn't the class clown, but I sat next to him and I right. studied <laughs> he's got it in his blood his grandfather in yiddish theater 
<laughs> it, that's right. I think what, what was the name of that uh, that production? Dibbick Schmibbick. <laughs> yes, something like the terrible, terrible Native American impression, though. Which he revisits, and yes. it, it, that's speaking of cringy, like that's that's pretty bad. But but you, I think we know people like this. We know some of these, whether it's a family member or somebody you went to school with. I think for me, like the the musical director Lloyd, Bob Balaban, who's like, I just have a job to do. <laughs> songs, right? You guys have to rehearse. Right. Like, stop are, changing things. He, th- there was an excitement to when Corky had to bow out of the production for, I think in total three minutes of the movie when he wasn't involved and like, all right, I'm running this and we're going to actually rehearse and we're going to go over lines. And we're going to learn it. And all of them seem like, well, I don't want to do that. I'd rather live in this like dream world that Corky's put up, which is that like, if you believe hard enough and if you sing in this very particular way, or you, you, then your dreams will come true coming from a guy whose dreams never came true. Uh, I, I think we all know people like the like, like Ron and Sheila. Sheila. Yes, yeah. absolutely. The big timers in a very, very, very small pond. That's right. Yeah. Or you know, the, the, your dentist who thinks he's he's very funny. Uh, what about Libby May here? Who's uh, how young is she supposed to be? Is she like uh, post high school age, right around there? The girl who works at the Dairy Queen. Yeah. Mm-hmm. DQ. That's right. I'm yeah, guessing that, her to be about 21. Okay. Yeah, that, that was my impression. Like she's she's still there after high school. Mm-hmm. And like this is this her future was just sort of like well this is the, the, the amount of time that they took and it was smart to keep it in uh, of like her describing life at Dairy Queen or like what what her goals were towards the end of the movie where it's like yeah I think my goal would be to come up with like a low fat no fat blizzard. Right. And it's so dreary to think about like, oh, this is your goal now. But I think that kind of pulls it back to none of us were expecting these people to make it, right? I don't think that's the point of the movie. You're not expecting them to really make it. I was just expecting that like, oh, I'm going to put on a show and hopefully it goes well. And then we get the rug kind of pulled out from under us with the, well, it's not really Guffman. Paul Benedict, I've never seen a human being more just and capture what a Mort Guffman would look like. So he sits down like, okay, you were clearly cast because you look like someone that would be potentially named this. Roy Loomis does not match. I Loomis Halloween. So, but yeah, I, I was stunned as he's going on and on about how he was excited and wanted to meet the cast. Like, okay, something's up. And the note came in, said, okay, this isn't the guy. We've got to switch a switcheroo. Right. But up to that point, when he sat down, I'm thinking, this, this might have happened for them. I, yeah, I was hoping more of a long, along the line of, that was terrible. That was terrible. That was worse than cats. <laughs> and, and yeah, and in the end, he was just a dude that was excited to like meet the cast of this. Yeah, the meet the stars. Story. Oh, wow. I just met the stars of, of this space. And take home a balloon. Yes, for his, for his little kid. A balloon for his uh, new nephew. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, it, it's it's supposed to highlight the inner workings of theater in a way, specifically on the actors. Um, do, do you think that, like, there was an accuracy here that was really important for Chris Guest to say, like, oh, this is, he's probably met a Corky in his life, Right. Um, the, the, the idea of someone who wants to turn every opportunity into the, the big break. Um, I, I think the movie really shines in its small vignettes and smaller scenes more so than we'll say Corky's goal. Matt, are you focused on Corky's goal of turning this into something really spectacular? Or is it really more about like, oh, the small town people and, and just seeing seeing them come together for something that's very important to them. They're what sequicentennial something. Like yes. That? The, yeah. By far, I am most captivated by the small town people and those interactions more so Same. than the musical. Although the musical is great. I love the, the opening part when you you're hearing about the uh, history from each of the, the people. Um, I love whenever the mayor, I think he's the mayor 
talking yes. about the parade and the remember the parade plan is on the whiteboard behind him. Yes. An arrow pointing down and an arrow pointing to the left. Like <laughs> that's the parade plan. Oh well, yeah, and, and and that's that's part of the the comedy of this movie is like really small things throughout that I think stand out more than uh, essentially our plot. Uh, our, our plot is, I think, takes a back seat to our sort of comedic instances. I think the movie starts you off with they are planning around the parade or, or part of the 150th uh, celebration. And they start talking about like buckets or barrels. They're looking at a model and they're like, well, what is that? A bucket or is that a barrel? And you can see like the tedium of this city council meeting and, and like how important it is that they get it right. And then we get the the turn towards the absurd, which is, well, how many riflemen do we need? I think we need a sniper at the top of this. Building. Yes. <laughs> and I think that really sets the tone for this humor is, is people taking something way too seriously. Is that accurate? Yeah, we've, David Cross's character out in the crop circle. And he's talking about, as he says, the weather is always the same, 67 degrees with a 40% chance of rain, always. <laughs> it's like, what, what does that mean? And all of these people, I kind of wanted more of the alien interaction. Paul Dooley, who's a native West Virginian, he plays the guy that got probed. And he talks about how he loses feelings in his, in his buttocks <laughs> every time. Every Sunday at the same time. Like, these are the people that you meet on the porch of their double wide, and yeah. you just want to have conversations with them. Clifford Woolley. I love that the town redneck taxidermist got into this. And you know what? Ridiculous, effeminate makeup and all. He tells a great story. I would sit down and listen to him. Like, he's got the rouge on and the eyeshadow, and I still... I want to sit by that campfire and I want to listen to him just spin a yarn. I think that's the magic of the movie. You leave <laughs> wanting more. Like you want more of these characters. And I think the brilliance of the movie was leaving it short. Like, yes. You just want more of that. Right, right. Or after watching the movie, I know that several of the cut scenes were put out on the DVD release. If you search Waiting for Guffman on YouTube, then you'll find some of those scenes. And I think it's like it's special that they made them. Uh, everybody has such warm memories of working on this movie. But yeah, keeping it short and for the audience wanting a little bit more out of these people, uh, including some like there are some of the characters whose parts are so, so small that y you don't want them to be distracting if you were to build on them. Uh, for instance, I think let, let's talk about Dr. Pearl's wife has a very small part. Uh, one of the council members, Steve, he's the one that's kind of got wide eyes for Corky. Oh, he's amazing. <laughs> he is amazing. And he he gets more screen time late. I think we could have used more vignettes of the townspeople. The first 30 minutes is full of them. But after that, we don't get them anymore. I would have liked them to stay throughout. I just think the more it's it's sort of like your answer, Matt. It's, it's about the small town liking this activity. Uh, th that's kind of what we're here for is it does seem real, doesn't it? I, I wanted more of those failed plays from Corky. The backdraft, we've covered backdraft on this podcast. That was a cursed episode. It took like three different times, but the burning newspapers and putting them through the vents and getting everything shut down in this backdraft catastrophe. I kind of wanted more of these things. What a, What other terrible ideas to put on the stage can you do right and maybe the style the mockumentary style doesn't allow like a flashback to like what it looked like when he did those performances but yeah there could have been something very fun to to look at those well speaking of him corky is kind of who's driving the the lust or the push for fame his own push uh, he he spent some time in New York before, off, 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 off Broadway. <laughs> He's right out of the Navy. Uh, is is Corky our most important character? At, would, would you consider that to be true at all? And then what what do you think about sort of this portrayal of we know effeminate, we would we would presume homosexual, um, sort of this character as 
even even in Blaine, kind of a special character that stands out about most. Yes, and I think it's fair to say he's critical. He drives the film, um, and the and the subtleties of the gay character are just wonderful. I read a blogger who talked about a gay blogger who talked about the film and he's sort of like, I know it might just be described as a film that is poking fun at being gay. And I probably shouldn't love it as much as I do, but I love it. So it's, that quirky character is just so well done. I think. Yeah. It's, you mentioned Mrs. Allen Pearl and she had a great line about quirky that I kind of heard a little bit too, because I like Scrabble, but she, we don't socialize with the creative types. We have our Scrabble club and um, other people with babies. Like she just has this weird uh-huh. rambling, trailing off uh, session. But you know what? We talked about this before coming on, and he's clearly keeping up some kind of facade because he says, hey, I go clothes shopping for my wife and struck up a conversation about pantyhose, and absolutely no one <laughs> – has met Corky's right. wife. So uh, there's a little bit of hiding who he is, but the town, I, I love the townspeople. They're just like, he's, he's just eccentric. He's, he's a creative type. And right. they just, they accept him for that. Just say, okay, all right, you, you go do your thing. We need you to be successful as a town. He is more delightful than he is a curiosity to be inspected. I think the Um, Junko jeans though, that's the, those have got to go. He's got a lot. And did you notice those were being worn backwards? Yes. (laughs) I I think it's, it was an, an opportunity for Christopher guest to play into some ideas that he had maybe had. Like I, I, I think back to when, when he feels like he has to quit the production, he's not getting enough money. And all, all the people are banging on his apartment door and he's sitting there in a bubble bath listening to, ah, what is he? It's not even sad music. It's like. It was Latin jazz. <laughs> <laughs> you know, sometimes, sometimes a, a director or uh, the, the writer of a movie will, will really want to like, they'll, they'll, they'll have some jokes in their head and be like, I got to get this joke in here somehow. Um, and I think with Chris Guest, the, idea of uh can i play a character who is practicing a jinko backward jinko jeans wearing guy doing a dance who has this horrific bowl cut uh as someone who should be posh like i think it's a little too late for that cut it's not it's not like a beverly hills cop style of like a view of hollywood like it's it's just so bizarre he's going gray uh there there's just some things about him that are uh, it's funny saying quirky and it sounds like quirky, but I think he just saw this as such an opportunity to let a lot of fun things out that it was really a, a nice joke delivery system. Um, but who else in our cast stood out as far as like, Ooh, I'm so glad that they had this opportunity to present this style of character. Love Fred Willard. Uh, yes. Uh, he's, his style is just uh, hilarious. I love it. I'm so happy he was in it. I feel like he's a driving character as well. He does smarmy arrogance really, really well. He just has this sense of entitlement. I I agree. I I love him, but I love his wife and the running gag of everybody knows her and knows her intimately. And she just keeps coming up. She gets drunk at the dinner party and just all of a sudden asks uh, Mrs. Pearl, What's it like to be with a circumcised man? Yeah, yeah. There are there are jokes that when they hit, it's like whoa! Like I almost <laughs> wasn't expecting it. Like we we were we're seeing um, kind of a swerving comedy car that's taking us to places that maybe we we weren't expecting to go. And then, uh, bam! The the character of Ron Albertson to to add in the fact we've got a lot of facts about him, right? All right he's never he's never left. <laughs> He's a travel agent who's never left plane. Hey, he left once. He went to, I don't even remember. It was some really minor town that Sheila reminds him of. Jefferson. He went to Jefferson once. For the surgery. 
for yes i love that bit because i thought it was gonna be something much more embarrassing and it's like it was a penis reduction but then the the second knife twist of it of well i tried to convince sheila to get a vaginal (laughs) enlargement yeah yeah Uh, like that i know that when it was handed to fred willard it was like a 10 to 12 page script and a lot of the rest was just like fill it in as we go and there had to be some things written down and i have a feeling that like oh yeah the only reason your character's ever left blaine is to get a penis reduction surgery like that had to be some either that either it's either that or fred willard decided to drop that in the shooting and they loved it so much that they just kept going with it uh, well, apparently I, oh go ahead well what i've heard i don't remember if this was on the uh, outtakes from the dvd but my memory is that so they, they film 10 minute scenes. There's a point to the scene. Uh, and then the characters are allowed to fill, fill the script however they want to, but they have to get this certain point. So apparently in the dinner scene, he, but they're not allowed to say what they're going to talk about in the scene, right? They have to come in and they don't know what the other person is going to do. It's kind of a secret little challenge. Yeah. Yes. Mm-hmm. But Fred Willard apparently broke the rules in the Chinese restaurant scene and told them, this is what I'm going to do. Okay. Just give them a little heads up. Uh, mm-hmm. He cheated just a little bit on that one. But they, I think Fred Willard came up with it from the way they talk about it. They went to Peking where they make the ducks. Where they <laughs> make the ducks. Right. And, well, and, and it makes you think, I wonder if Catherine O'Hara just chose. Today, in this scene, I'm going to choose for my character to have, to have had too much wine. Because it truly doesn't matter to anything else in the movie. She's not shown as someone who gets too drunk. It's just like, oh, in this scene, it's just, it leads us, it, it creates something that's kind of special. And I know that Eugene Levy had mentioned that to, to preserve the specialness of some of the scenes, he frequently had to maneuver himself towards the back of the group yeah. and out of the shot because he was trying so hard to hold in his laughter because whatever had come up in the scene was just killing him. And he was like, this is too funny. I don't want to ruin the shot. He couldn't handle the dancing. Yeah. And, and Fred Willard didn't, he wasn't informed about the lazy eye joke. So as (laughs) soon as he says, what do you see with your keen eyes? And then sees Eugene (laughs) Levy doing that. He lost it and had to leave the set. Right. Like it's, it's, it's purely like, it's it's gag. It's a sight gag, but y- this movie isn't like exempt from pulling it. Like it's okay that they go with with something like that when a lot of the other things are either carefully crafted or they're mined from such a special comedy place of of improv that uh, it's hard to tell. It's really hard to tell like what's there on purpose and what's not. Um, speaking of what's there on purpose and it does seem to baffle me, Matt. What do you think about? the savages johnny savage and red savage uh the the local mechanics what what, because you've seen this movie the most what what's their real importance to this movie or does it does it kind of make sense that they phase out i think it makes sense that they phase out i think they're only johnny savage is only there so that he will not be there like that's his only purpose in the film and Interestingly, to the, today, Johnny Savage is a urologist in Oregon. Nice. And he was, <laughs> I think, the only one, or maybe who had literally no improv experience going in. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think you're right, because we get that, that scene where Corky is obviously a little bit smitten with Johnny. Mm-hmm. Like, How tall are you? 6'2". <laughs> six, six Wow. <laughs> and it just kind of ends on that, which is a very awkward transition. There are a ton of those. He does do the, I have a private number. It's not listed and does, does that scene. But I think we're set up to, they don't have to beat you over the head with a joke, but now we know there's a six, two in shape man and his wardrobe now has to fit Corky. And we get that of none of it fits right at all. Right. Right. And, and, you know, I think it, it is kind of special, uh, maybe not forward thinking in like, I, I don't, I don't suppose it was something that was really thought about, but the character 
is effeminate without being portrayed as like a a, a licentious maniac. Uh, it's better that it's subtle. Uh, and and I think of the time, 96, you, you could have had a character like that uh, eyeing him up and down all the time or maybe being like having more advances shown on screen. And I think it's it's positive that it wasn't shown that way. Uh, hopefully that was a choice because it doesn't have to be like that. Well, that's Steve's part. I mean, Steve is that's straight true. up smitten by a quirky. <laughs> Everything quirky does is amazing. He is a genius and he is just infatuated with the man. Steve's eyes, like, if nothing else, just pure eye acting. I could just have that dude in every movie. You know, you're, you're right. His eyes, when quirky comes in to ask for the 100K, uh, are so filled with excitement as to what could be. I mean, we've only got 15,000. <laughs> um, yeah, so, you know, I, I was thinking about, like, the, the conflicts in this movie. It was talking about Johnny Savage not being there. I think, Matt, you hit it on the head. He's only in the movie to not be in the play, like, to, to kind of force Corky to, to come in, which I think we kind of wanted... As an audience, we would have wanted to see him on stage. I didn't want to see Corky just like behind the scenes as a director, and I definitely didn't want to see Johnny Savage doing anything. Uh, it was better that he was gone so that Corky could come in. Uh, but what about like Red Savage, Brian Doyle Murray here, who I, I would I would like to nominate as being underused. Uh, he's he he just doesn't allow his son to be in the play. There's really no other information there. He doesn't, he doesn't thinks this is a waste of time. He's kind of unlike most of the other citizens of Blaine that like everybody else is excited about the parade and the celebration, but he's just kind of like, no, this isn't for us. It's hey, you're in Blaine, Missouri. It's, it's backwards. Your son is a mechanic. He is doing manly things. Mm -hmm. And a lot of those types of people are, Hey, theater is effeminate. You are a man's man. Stay out of a woman's world or stay out of an effeminate world. And it's sad because Johnny was excited about it. He he seemed to really be getting into it. But then he's got to follow his dad and stick to only manly, manly things. Yeah, right. but I agree. It's surprising because Brian Doyle Murray isn't like a superstar, but he's a recognizable character in the film and he gets – whatever it is 20 seconds yeah it's yeah it's really light this could easily be played by kurtwood smith another red with red another form red yeah yeah that's that can make sense uh i i, I think about the, its nomination for this list that it didn't actually make but whether it's the mockumentary style whether it's the low box office do you think this movie deserves to be in some top 100 comedies list? I mean, I, I do just cause I, I laugh every time I watch it. It's full of laughs for me. So I, it's an easy yes for me. We would have to consult Russell. I mean, he's got them all ranked. I think he's at several hundred. I, I have never attempted to put a top 100 together. I, I don't know. I don't know if it would make mine, but honestly, I look at the AFI's top 100 and I get mad every single time because most of them are not funny. It's <laughs> it's very, very frustrating. What I would have that's very, very funny, like Super Troopers is funny to me. Waiting mm -hmm. is funny to me. Uh, Rat Race is funny to me. Loved Pink Panther. That's not on there. A funny thing happened on the way to the forum. So I... I don't know. A personal list? It might. Well, and I think it might have to do with the style, with the mockumentary style. And Matt, you said that like this is years before The Office. Uh, there are other mockumentary movies and other styles of shows out there. Um, I kind of want to turn this over to you. Would you say a mockumentary style is something you have to learn to appreciate? I suppose so. Uh, although when I first fell in love with them, I don't know that I had learned how to appreciate them. I just knew I liked them. Um, I think the more you watch them, the more you know how this is going to work and the more you anticipate and the more you're let down sometimes too. Like A Mighty Wind to me was a great letdown film because I hmm. know what can happen in this format and it didn't. Okay. You know, and sometimes you don't have to know that a movie is in a particular type of category 
to realize that you like it. For instance, uh, my first five-star movie I, I rated on this podcast was Scream. But I would have never put Scream in a not like in a diff like a sub horror genre of the like the meta horror genre. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that was a thing. It just sort of happened like, oh, I like this. And then it wasn't until Cabin in the Woods came out that I was like, oh wait, maybe I actually love this. So I think waiting for Guffman could be just like a jumping off to be like, but wait, you didn't watch th this is Spinal Tap 13 years ago. Well you, you gotta see it now. I actually thought that the post movie like press tour or the appearances from the spinal tap actors as their characters specifically guest. And I think Michael McKeon. Yes. Seeing them play those characters out on talk shows was so wild. And you know, I, it was before I was born, but I think just so special to see those clips. Um, <clears throat> I could definitely see, I mean, we have Sasha Baron Cohen who plays these characters out in the real world. Uh, specifically Ali G, and then he he did some Bru stuff as Bruno. I, I think it's it's almost like when when you push past the limits of a normal movie, but of what our, our traditional comedies are, uh, you you have more of an opportunity to gain a cult following, which I believe this movie has. So this is like a gateway drug for you. This is the gateway to other things. I think so. And, and I think it's also sort of a, if, if you start to realize that like Catherine O'Hara, Fred Willard, Balaban, like some of these people, I think the the Balaban movie that I was let down with, I think Monuments Men was a let down for me uh, because and Goodman was in that too. But essentially there, there are times when uh, it doesn't matter how many moments of a particular type of genre fail as long as you've got some of those shining gems. And I think this one counts as just one of those shining gems of the mockumentary style. Yeah, I'm a huge fan. We talk about sliding scales, and even though Napoleon Dynamite isn't so much a mockumentary, but it, it's in the same style of humor. But on the other side of the scale, my happy place is what we do in the shadows. That is my all-time favorite mockumentary. It, it mixes horror I, I love the idea of following around a troop of vampires, and Taika Waititi is fantastic. The show itself that is, is on FX, love it. And I think that is an easier gateway because it's it's a little bit more out there and ridiculous mm -hmm. and a little less grounded. I think that's an easier way. If I showed this to my wife, she did not like The Office she really hates Napoleon Dynamite. I'm positive if I showed her this movie, she might make it 25 minutes in, and then it would be, please make this stop. You know what I think, though? I think this movie really takes off after 35 minutes. Uh, I, I think once you get closer to showtime, I think that's when the movie really takes off. Um, and and I'll, I'll say, honestly, in my first, you know, my first watching of it, um, I would say I was I was going through all the vignettes and I'm recognizing some people that I know. Uh, I think David Cross was the one. Uh, Bob Odenkirk yeah. is actually one of the audition people. So if you bet you better call Saul fans, uh, you'll notice. Uh, Bob yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you'll notice he gets Bob. a great part. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think uh, this movie actually took a little bit of time to ramp up into into what I into what I eventually wanted. And I think it came together really well I, I will say if the production had a bunch of problems and like on stage there were like set pieces falling down or people forgetting their lines then it would have really crossed the line into like the cringe where the uh, things aren't going right Th like the, the sitting in that i think would be uncomfortable but considering that the play was especially to the citizens of blaine a rousing success uh, it did. It, it felt good at the end, even though our successes are, 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 you know, you described in the plot summary, Chad, like what we end up seeing is, all right, uh, Dr. Pearl is performing for senior citizens in Miami. Right. And, um, you know, Fred and Catherine, uh, Ron and Sheila are doing commercial work in Hollywood. Like it, it's not, it's really not glamorous, but at least it, it seems, it seems like, this is this is kind of real. Like this would just kind of happen, and what would you know? We, we just caught a glimpse of this special moment in Missouri, you know, weird little town where I mean, the joke the joke is great. It, the city was founded because they thought they found California. 
Yeah. <laughs> Salt in the air. It's perfect. The movie there... takes off, I think. It takes off in the auditions. Yes. The yes. auditions are where, like, okay, this is going to be good. Raging Bull audition is when you're like, oh, this is going to be good. I knew what was coming. I love Raging Bull. Like, hey, there aren't too many scenes you can act. And as soon as he opened his mouth, it's like, yep, you went with the one. I wonder, is, is that is that the part? Because this movie is rated R. That, that definitely earned it its R. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. its only justification. Yeah, that one moment, which is so easy to edit out, but it has to stay. <laughs> yeah. You know, I think you're right. Is is That is where you see the, the movie take off. I think I remember watching Fred Willard say that to get into the character of Ron Albertson, Ron Albertson would probably believe that a performance he saw in a commercial would be the height of acting. So that's what he went into his audition scene with Catherine O'Hara with. Is it like, my character thinks that commercial acting is the best that you can do. And, and to know that after the fact, and his story ends up with them doing commercials. Uh, hey, commercial work still work, right? <laughs> uh, so, yeah, you that's, know, that nails it. There are a lot of jokes in this movie. I just... I feel it, whether it's improv or whether it's uh, whether it's like the delivery of some kind of line, the idea that they spend time is like, we're the stool capital of the world. Okay. There's an obvious, you know, there's an obvious little poo poo joke there. That's yes. fine. But are there any other just like comedic moments that like, it's not about that. Like you almost, they almost transcend waiting for Guffman. It's like, Oh, it's an inside joke between Matt, you and your friend or like any type of like joke that like sticks with you from this movie. Well, I can say my friends and I have exchanged the line, I hate you and I hate your ass face. <laughs> yes. We've given that line to each other many times. I There are little throwaway things that are just completely unexplained. Like Libby is putting Vaseline on her skin at one point, And there's no explanation whatsoever for another one of one of the stagehands has a blow dryer and she is blow drying <laughs> Corky's crotch, and the implication is he uh, he did not shake enough. <laughs> but right. we, we cut away from that, and then it just moves on. And these are the types of things that I just appreciate are there. It's it's not as obvious as the Monty Python cat being beat against the wall in the background, but I I appreciate the the little things that have no other explanation. The There's... the lone piece of chicken on the grill, one yeah. chicken wing. <laughs> Oh yeah, she's recounting like I'll always have Dairy Queen, and she's just fanning this one. I mean, it might be a full thigh, but it's just one piece. So bleak, honestly. Yeah, I think that the thing that I like I I will think of is I really like uh, any time in a movie that somebody is like prepping themselves to go on stage or prepping themselves to perform. Um, I think of when Keanu Reeves's character kind of bites his jaw in Devil's Advocate. Uh, there's a, there's a couple times like when, when people are like getting into the zone and I think Ron and Sheila, they do a little like hand movement to like go from travel agent into actor mode for their yes. audition that like, I can see myself doing that, uh, doing that little hand motion as a joke, uh, for any other friends of mine that, that know, that know the movie, you kind of need to know it. I think we consider ourselves bi-coastal. If you consider the Mississippi river, a coast, I love it. That's a very good one too. Uh, well, you know, I would say best in show is something I had seen before. Um, I did not see the most recent one, uh, mascots. And, and it's, it's something where I sometimes get a little worried because I know spinal tap is good and I, and I have my memories of it. Um, and Guffman, luckily for me, like, oh, it hit the spot. And I, and I think the, the high 91% rating for it is very good. Um, I, I'm almost worried that, that with, with mockumentaries, it, the, the appeal isn't wide enough. Like, Chad, you mentioned, like, oh, if I showed my wife this, it would only be 20 minutes before she'd be like, oh, I, I can't handle it anymore. Um, is that is that kind of like guests legacy is that like oh the mockumentary can work it's not going to be a box office breaker this is his thing this is his troop between I, I, again i haven't seen a mighty win but i love that the cast largely got back together for best in show and it just seems like it 
it doesn't matter if it's a success. Everyone has such charming stories out of this, and it just seems like they had fun. You know, juxtapose that with we talk about The Shining, where everyone hated every second on set, mm. and it's just a miserable time, and actresses were tortured. Poor Shelley Duvall. Right. So, so everyone, I, the, Adam Sandler, in all of his stupid movies where he goes to Hawaii with Kevin James, eh, David Spade, none of these are good movies. They're probably not going to make a lot of money, but Adam Sandler's like, I'm rich. I'm going to take my friends. We're going to have a great time in a tropical place and eh, have some fun. I do like thinking that this particular crew, like this set of actors, kind of understands that like this, we love doing this. And it's almost like a duty of ours to like keep this genre alive in a way. Or like there, there are some people that like just kind of dip their toe into it, like Jane Lynch or something. P- people that kind of um, bounce into one of these movies, if not many of them. And, and you just kind of think like, it's almost there. It's, it's like a sacred duty to uphold improv on a mockumentary stage. But a- after listening to their interviews, you really do kind of feel like this is, this is really lovely for them to do. Uh, especially since we do hear that so many productions are plagued with uh, people not having a great time. You can kind of see it on screen that like, this was truly a pleasure for them to do. And if you are a fan of this genre, it's a pleasure for you to appreciate more so than just the laughs in the movie. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, there's plenty of things to talk about. We started talking about jokes. We started talking about bits or even just the absurdity of some of this stuff. But I'd like to do it in the format of our superlatives. Uh, You ready to do that, boys? Absolutely. Ready. Well, We'll start with our guest, Matt. Who do you think is our MVP of this movie? I'm going to go with Fred Willard. I love the Chinese restaurant scene. I love the auditions. I love his presence in every scene. It's hard uh, to pick one, but if I had to pick one, it would be Fred Willard. Yeah, he he is sort of a, a pillar in this world of mockumentaries, and you can tell he really enjoys what he does. Chad, what about you, MVP? I have to go with the director and star. I think he just towed a very, very hard line of when to be cringy and when to be just laugh out loud funny. And he does it really well. So Christopher Guest and his shop of movie memorabilia. I definitely want waiting or dinner, my dinner with Andre. I want that play set. Yeah, you want the action figures. And that's Which the is great actually, thing about action figures. You can make them do whatever you want. That's actually in... Wallace Shawn's house. Wallace Shawn wanted in this movie and they couldn't make it happen. So that's how that came about. And Wallace Shawn has them prominently displayed in his house, which is sweet. Wallace Shawn. Uh, that's our, that's our inconceivable. Yes. That is Vicini himself. <laughs> that's right. Vicini. Uh, well, well, you know, I actually went with, um, I went with guest and Levy as the writing team. Cause I mean, I, I think Chris guest that it's kind of his uh, forte. But uh, I, I like the idea that they came together with 12 pages and said, with this and with this crew that we set up, it's like a heist. How, how do we make this work? And we make it work with a combination of uh, good bones of the plan and the good people to execute the plan, uh, even though the plan isn't directly written. Um, and that, in, that includes some, like I was unfamiliar with Parker Posey's work, uh, but I, I think like putting the idea together to make this work uh, was was good, and I'm glad that like someone took a shot at it. Uh, so it's the the writing duo of Guest and Levy. I don't care, audience, if you think that's cheating for me to pick two people. They're a writing duo here. Matt, who's your best supporting actor here? Eugene Levy, medicine man, not going there. <laughs> dances with Stumpy. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> rough to listen to. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> he's great though. I love that he had such a good time. Right. And I, and I am glad that he has recognition outside of the American pie films, which I think he was an integral part of, uh, but also, I mean, his son in that show, I think that this is, this is a kind of a, a late, a very late um, kind of thread off of these relationships built was like Schitt's Creek. 
very popular and was something that people could not stop talking about over the last four years. Um, but even, you know, his son uh, kind of building up in that comedic world um, has a lot of acclaim to his name now as well. Chad, who's your best supporting actor? I went with Fred Willard. I love everything that he does. I, I can't think of a movie where he's been disinteresting or even just like I could recast him. So I he's he just embodies that small town big shot. I he, he he's another small town big shot kind of in a way. Isn't he like the the studio manager of the San Diego Anchorman movie? Isn't he involved there? Do you guys remember this? He might be. It's been too long since I've seen that. Yeah. But yeah, it's, it's funny that some of these guys can can make appearances in in larger, much more. I mean, I'd say much more people know Anchorman than they know wait, uh, Waiting for Guffman. But he, he he's when he arrives, he's special. It's why, you know, for our first icebreaker question, he, I think he's he really does brighten up everything he's in. I had too hard of a time, you know, thinking about this as like an ensemble cast. And aside from the savages, um, I think everybody did such a great job playing these little niche roles. Uh, so I went with someone who had an even smaller part. You could almost call this a hidden gem. Uh, Michael Hitchcock is Steve Stark, uh, the the councilman who was infatuated with Corky. Uh, he's probably only on screen for a minute and a half total, but I just I think it's it's absolutely wonderful when he's there, um, especially since it's kind of backloaded. So that's my that's my best supporting. Matt, who is your hidden gem? This is probably going to catch people by surprise. It's not because she's necessarily funny, but I think Mrs. Pearl captures a dentist's wife so well. (laughs) She's so supportive. Uh, I just think she plays her role perfectly. I love Mrs. Pearl. I think she really captures being uncomfortable being (laughs) being asked that direct question at the Chinese restaurant. Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's it's not. I think she she does play uh, straight man. She's like she 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 plays that well in the in that role. But yeah, I can see that being a nice hidden gem. Chad, what about you? Going back to Mr. Paul Dooley from West Virginia, plays the re- the abducted resident that every Sunday around the same time has no feelings in his buttocks. <laughs> you know, there's there's something about that as a hidden gem, which is. I really thought that vignette was going to be just kind of a throwaway vignette. Like, oh, it was funny to talk about this guy who said he was abducted. And then the alien abduction becomes a big part of Red, White, and Blaine. Nothing ever happens on Mars. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, I, you know, even even with the the big alien head knocking on the stage set and, you know, the, the people laugh. Like it's it's the, the, the movie does kind of round out or kind of complete itself during that. My hidden gem's a little odd. I did mention that the art direction <laughs> and the musicians, we only, essentially this movie only focuses on our performers uh, on stage. But I think the thing that was like the hidden gem about this is that like, there's absolutely no problem for the stage and the art direction and the music and the sound and every other thing about the production. Everything goes exactly as, like, as it should. And there's things that are like the, the spinning gears during the stool factory yeah. song, um, the to the left and right, the the train coming in and all of the like like the, the set dressing, it all it all like went off without a hitch. And I know we didn't spend any time on it because this music, this movie has very little music in it, but the songs played during the show are really well done and, and it looks accurate, uh, especially even even for the triple threat, triple uh, trumpeter, timpani, xylophonist. Yes. It all, it all works out. So I think that my gem is truly hidden because nothing, we, we encounter no problems. Even, even though Corky's told he can't have the big budget he wants, what else was he going to do? Right. <laughs> Everything works out fine. All right, Matt, we're coming to a tough one. Uh, I need you to recast someone in this movie. Who do you think it's going to be? I think I would, if forced to, I wouldn't want to mess with perfection, but if forced to, right. I would recast the, I don't know his name, I apologize, the his, the town historian. I think I would give it to Martin Short. 
Martin Short wanted to be cast in this film. Hmm. The guy that played Clifford Woolley, the the redneck taxidermist? Uh, No, no. The one who is telling the story at the very beginning of the history of the Okay. Gotcha. He's wonderful. But knowing that Martin Short wanted in and Christopher Guest wouldn't let him in because he didn't want any uh, well-known faces. Yeah. Just I'd like to see Martin Short in the lineup. You you know that he would eat up any any space in this. And I think it'd be a delight. Uh, what about you, Chad? Who are you having to recast? I love David Cross, but for the joke, I'm going with Giorgio Sakalas, who hosts Ancient Aliens. <laughs> so I think it would be funny to get him as the town alien expert. I'm surprised you know his name or that anybody knows his name. Is he the dude with the crazy hair that kind of yes. looks like he touched one of those electric glass bowls? It's it's usually not that crazy, but yes, he's, he's the guy in the memes of just going... <laughs> Aliens, aliens with the hand gestures yes yeah yeah you know and i i do feel like we i wanted more of those vignettes anybody that wanted that would have wanted into one of these movies because i feel like it's become such a chris guest thing to be like uh, we're putting on a mockumentary like this it's almost it almost has the appeal of drawing cameos like muppet movies do like like oh i, I want to be involved somehow just like one memorable scene yeah, the the Gwen Fabian Blunt, she's the descendant of the Blaine Fabian family, and she goes, I kind of know how the Kennedys feel. Yes. Like, <laughs> we, we, we don't get enough of her, and she's some councilwoman. She pretty much disappears. I will say, I, I was almost going to bring up the Martin Short thing myself. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to recast Linda Cash, who is Dr. Pearl's wife. She did a great job. I don't think it's not taking away from what job she did. But I was thinking of who kind of would fit into this today. And I realized that if I'm looking at the time frame right, 96, Catherine Hahn would have been 21 or 22 during filming. But I do think that uh, if if the age were just fudged a little bit, that she could do a great job of, of being like the dentist's wife, but like having just one or two instances of being a little funny. Another person who is, um, I think kind of Alicia Silverstone's friend and Anchorman. It's another weird Anchorman reference. But Catherine Hahn. Okay. All let's right. look at our best shot for Waiting for Guffman. Matt, what's your best shot? Corky's in his apartment. He is trying to figure out the choreography for the dances. He's wearing <laughs> his jeans backwards and just giving us a wonderful dance routine to practice at home. <laughs> it is It is good. Um, I will tell y'all that I watched this movie in two sittings, but I, I stopped the movie right after that little scene. And when I decided to pick it back up the next day, I had to rewind that scene and watch it again because I, I loved I loved what he was doing with that with his backward jeans. Chad, what's your best shot? The audience shots of Steve just bawling during Red, White, and Blaine. I just can't get enough of this guy's eye acting and just how infatuated he can look at Corky. I wish anyone looked at me like that. My wife does not look at me like that. (laughs) Oh, well, we can all dream uh, (laughs) to have our wives look at us lovingly. Yes, Uh, like Steve does, Corky. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Um, I will say um, that, was it during Red, White, and Blaine, like the final number? I think it's during, what's the name of that song? Like A Penny for Your Thoughts? Which was amazing. Yeah, that's that was great. great song. Yeah, so while I, I won't say, unlike some of our other musicals that we've uh, <laughs> listened to or, or covered, um, I'm not listening to the soundtrack of Red, White, and Blaine, but that's a good song. Right. Uh, my best shot is the pull-away shot while he's listening to his Latin jazz. Uh, they're all knocking on his door. They're worried about Corky, and he's sitting there soaking in a bubble bath, just looking so forlorn. Uh, he's in a shower cap protecting his little bowl cut. Yes. Uh, but like, you know, I think, I think you kind of have comedy instincts after a, a while and you, the, 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 the shot starts on just the radio and you know, when you pull out, you're going to see just, I was kind of expecting him to be crying, but it, Corky is just like completely lost this, this, the, the, the idea that the dream of the production is fading away. He doesn't have the money, uh, but it's, it just, it's, it's a, it's just a perfect amount of absurd and the, the pull-out shot is good. Let's go a little larger with uh, a, the total scene. Matt, what's your best scene? This is hard, uh, but I'm going to f- pick the Chinese restaurant scene. 
I <laughs> watch it on repeat over and over again. Uh, you're a medical <laughs> man. Uh, let me show you something. <laughs> <laughs> He's a dentist. You're a medical man. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, we've 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 moved on to talking about Miami, dear. Uh, her, her, her hair is so wildly high yes. up front. Uh, yes, and it's it's that that's another that's a it's a cringy one. But uh, yeah, I, I had the pleasure of watching that one twice as well. Chad, what's your best scene? Matt nailed it earlier for me. The talent tryouts were just fantastic, but what sold it for me was the old guy reenacting Raging Bull. I I knew what was coming, and it still made me crack up. So. I couldn't even find that guy's name, but he was awesome. And, you know, part of those aud- auditions was like Eugene Levy doing some kind of like medley. And- yes, Camptown Races. And oh, uh, I Dream of Genie is what he started with, which was oh, so strange. Oh, my goodness. That that was about the tipping point for like, ooh, is it going to be like this the whole movie? Exhibit I was. Is. Yeah, I was very concerned. Like, this is heading Napoleon Dynamite territory. Uh huh. I, I I know what you mean, but yeah, my stomach was starting to churn. But in the end, it settled into this wonderful space. My best scene, uh, I wrote down here: chairs for fools. Everybody wants a stool. It is the play itself. Uh, the the during the movie, the small amount of time that you've been knowing these characters, you kind, I believe. That, like you, you kind of get sucked into believing that these are small town actors or small town people really reaching way beyond their ability, not to the other way around of, of you know, seasoned professional actors playing ca- characters who are not good at acting. Uh, and I, I feel like the, the play kind of set that off. Matt, I didn't know what you said about like, oh, they intentionally didn't study the choreography enough. It's smart. It's genius. Yeah. You can tell. And in the, you know, essentially hour and 16 that you see anybody on stage, like they really don't spend that much time rehearsing their lines. It's kind of Bob Balaban, uh, Lloyd, it's kind of his big things like, why aren't we rehearsing enough? Uh, (laughs) And eventually we get, oh, no, it does come together. Because I could I could definitely have seen that production falling apart. And I would have had to watch the rest of the movie through my eyes, through my eyes, through through my hands, peeking through my fingers, because I would have been so terrified. But I, I think the the play coming together as my best scene. A couple of smaller ones now. Matt, what's your best wardrobe or makeup moment? I'm going to go with the backward jeans or a cork. <laughs> it's hard to beat. With a crop top and orange undershirt, yes. Yes. Uh, what about you, Chad? I'm going to be different because that's all, that's the obvious choice, but... <laughs> The fez that Clifford Woolley puts on as he's done with his campfire tale and he joins the end of Red, White, and Blaine is just it's such an awkward touch that I could see someone being like, yeah, this is a good idea, and everyone just goes with it. It's a terrible idea. It is weird. Yeah, a little American flag fez. I kind of looked at it as a skull cap. Uh, yeah. It's it just, just a bit strange. Now, you do have some other wonderful American flag-themed clothing in that scene, uh, Corky in particular is wearing like a jacket with some white tassels down the back. Um, I'm surprised that didn't end up being my choice. My best wardrobe moment was, and it does have to do with uh, Johnny being in the film so that he can't be in the show, is that the military outfit really doesn't fit Corky. No. <laughs> and so during that scene, which has a lot of dancing and has a lot of movement and the focus is on them, it, the idea that it's too big for him uh, and he's still, hey, he's a champ. He's a professional. He's going to act through it, and he does. So I, I thought that was wonderful. Uh, let's change one thing about the movie. We know you hold it in very high regard, Matt, but uh, what's one thing that you would change? This probably isn't what you're going for, but uh, since I'm new here, I would say more of the town afterwards. We see the characters, where they are in the at the end, but you don't hear much from the townspeople where they are. I, I guess just more at the end. Yeah. You want to hear from the council of saying what yeah. a roaring success it was and how it's really brought in several hundred dollars for the fundraiser or something like that. Exactly. Exactly. 
I'm oh, up for it. Yeah. Oh, I could see that. And, and or something being like, and you know, and this was a wildly successful 150th celebration. The play brought in, you know, 20 percent of what the bake sale did. Like, yeah. like really, really putting it into perspective how the, not meaningful it was, but to the small town, it seems so meaningful. I I can see there being a lot of uh, gold to mine there. The influx of tourism that they got. Yes, absolutely. A huge influx into Blaine, Missouri, the California of the Midwest. Uh, what's your change one thing, Chad? I think we've covered it to death. I want more vignettes from the townsfolk. I want to spend more time with the residents of Blaine outside of our musical cast. You're right. And we, you know, I, it was hard for me not to choose that as well. Like more vignettes, more opportunities to get some whether it's just throwaway jokes, whatever it is, I, I could see that being something we need more of. Mine actually is uh, going back to the savages. Um, now, you know, Matt really summed it up like, oh, he's it, it, he has to leave the production. But we really have no details about it except for what we kind of gleaned, which was that you know, Brian Doyle Murray's character, Red, doesn't want his son involved. And we don't even see them again. I would love for there to be a good reason why it's something really out of left field, like red used to dream about being an actor, but had his dreams crushed during like the 125th. It would be a, a good way to subvert of expectations. Yeah. 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 And I'm not trying to outsmart Chris Guest and Levy here, but I'm just like, it's having a reason why there was, we know there was time to, to elaborate on that a little bit more. Uh, so to, to have him involved or, you know, even just the classic, like there's a, we know there's a reserved seat in the crowd, but what if, you know, we see, we see red show up to the play and he's actually excited to watch it. I, who knows? There's a lot of reasons why the principal actor gets taken out of the production in movies. It's been done a lot, uh, but I'd like to have some, something there that they could at least, you know, let some vines grow on this particular subject. Uh, but it's not enough to even consider it a detractor. It's just something, something I thought they could have done. Uh, this is probably our hardest. <laughs> What's the best quote of the movie, Matt? I'm going to grab, um, we consider ourselves bi-coastal. If you consider <laughs> the Mississippi River one of the coasts, it's just so absurd. It's, it's phenomenal. I, I promise you I'm telling the truth here. I physically did a spit take. I was drinking a pop, and in the middle of them saying that, <laughs> it has been years since I've done that, but just awesome. that instant <laughs> What's so magical about it is he came up with it on the spot. Like it wasn't written. He just thought yeah. it up. Like, what? You know what else is great about that is we know that the character Ron makes jokes. It's very obvious when he does. And it's kind of dominating when he does. So you can tell that's not a joke he's making. He believes right. it. Right. <laughs> um, Chad, you got a best quote? And when Corky quits and he says, I'm going home and I'm going to bite my pillow. That's what I'm going to do. <laughs> to absolutely, to to the, a city council that just is like, okay. <laughs> right. sure. Except for Steve. And I'm just going to bite my pillow. Yes, that's a good one too. We actually uh, covered mine, uh, but not fully. Uh, it is when the response to the $100,000 ask one of the members says 15,000 covers everything. And that includes swimming. Yes. <laughs> like, how could you have forgotten about swimming? And he has to elaborate. No, I mean like, like the pools, the swimming pools. Like <laughs> as, I, I'm in on budget meetings as, as Matt. So yes, it, it could come out like this. <laughs> and that includes swimming. Yeah. Uh, uh, there are, many other jokes. And I would say that the jokes and the quotes are why this particular one, this particular mockumentary is something that I believe I will rewatch, or at least I'll take the risk of saying, Hey, do you want to watch this weird, like mockumentary thing? Uh, <laughs> let, let's, let's take an hour and a half and, and knock it out. Cause this is, this is probably what I would start with. Matt, we have to rate this movie and we rate from zero to five stars, 0.5 half star intervals are allowed. So what do you rate this movie out of five stars? That's an easy question for me. It's a five star film. 
It's a uh, one of my favorite comedies of all time. I love it. It yeah, I think we I think we maybe learned <laughs> that he would be rating this one high, but uh, I can see why. Chad, what about you? What is your rating here? I'm going four stars. It made me laugh, which is the primary goal of a comedy movie, mm-hmm. and it it's weird. I had a good time. So Matt, you you knew me well enough. This was a this was a good recommendation. I think that's important is like, did you have a good time? Because both you and I, Chad, we were talking about like the the towing the line, like to, is this going to be too much? Is this going to be too cringy? And uh, I'm, I'm actually going to land on four as well. Four stars for me. I will say when I started it, um, the first 30 minutes, I was actually teetering more towards a three or kind of teetering to like, oh, am I even going to like this? Because there are there are times when, you know, you try and, and you want to see is this is this worth what people are saying? And I think it, towards the end, the ninety one percent is probably a little high for me. But uh, this is for for what it's trying to do. That's kind of how I like to gauge it. Is for what it's trying to do. Did it do it? Yeah, it did with a plum. Uh, so as far as mockumentaries go, it's five star mockumentary. As far as the wide appeal or <clears throat> having to know who's the kind of person that can watch this. Um, it might be unfair to put it in these categories, but I think four stars is appropriate. And it, it is funny. I I fall into the area where I don't know if this lands on a hundred list or a five hundred list. It lands on its own special list of something you would see where I like to rate it and still say it's definitely a movie I would recommend. You just got to know who you're recommending it to. Right. Yeah. Well, Chad, I think it's time for us to look forward to next week. Yeah, this is insane. So. I have what's known as a dealer's choice. We each take a, some time and we, as hosts, get to pick our own movies. And Russell usually demands them ahead of time. I got my dealer's choice in and I picked something that wound up being directly following this movie. Had nothing to do. Had never seen Waiting for Guffman. So Waiting for Guffman ends in a playset of My Dinner with Andre. That was my dealer's choice. That is next week. This is complete serendipity. Wow. Wallace Shawn, I am making you guys watch My Dinner with Andre from 1981. Here's the description. Two old friends meet for dinner. As one tells anecdotes detailing his experiences, the other notices their differing worldviews. So yeah, yeah, that's a that's a description. I'm interested in what the trailer looks like for this movie. So yeah, get out your your action figures and have that dinner conversation with Andre. Wow, that rules! I cannot believe that it worked out that way because uh, it, it, it yeah. blew my mind. It, <laughs> I have had this months in advance, and then here comes Matt, and it's just like let's do this movie. Wow, yeah, I mean, it, it just it comes together sometimes. Well, Matt. Thank you so much for coming back on the show. Yeah, thank you for having me. And next time it'll be Remains of the Day. <laughs> we'll bring our matching. I haven't seen boxes. it. I haven't seen it. So you keep feeding me new movies. I like it. And that's why we love our guests. And thank you once again. And thank you, all the lords, ladies, and knights of the Retro Movie Roundtable. We invite you to reach out to us. We want to hear from you. Subscribe, rate, and review us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Pandora, or wherever you get your podcasts. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. Give us a like on Facebook, Instagram, and follow us on Twitter at movie underscore retro. Email us at retromovieroundtable at yahoo.com. Producing and providing this podcast is fun, but not free. We invite you to support the show at our Patreon page at www.patreon.com slash retromovieroundtable. Any contribution is much appreciated and will go towards making the show better for you, the listeners. As always, thank you for listening. Be good to each other and watch more movies. Chad? Why don't you just make 10 louder and make 10 be the top number and make that a little louder? These go to 11. <laughs>